Thanks very much, Malcolm. Uh, can you hear me? Is that okay? I uh, have to admit to being a wee bit daunted by uh, someone of my background speaking about planning to planners, but I'll do my best. And I, I, <coughs> There's no way I'll live up to Malcolm's introduction, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, I shall find my, my background's really in a number of things, like most of us. Um, it's not just in architecture. It's, I started off in, in uh, mechanical and production engineering. Uh, I've also had some time in uh, land management, particularly agriculture and forestry, and, and these kind of associated areas. Now, okay, I'm going to try and cover quite a wide range of, of things. Um, I'm aware that the the days there's two days here, so I want to touch on just a little bit on leadership because uh, I've had to fulfil that function myself over the past uh, ten years or so. But I'm going to focus obviously on on the planning side of things uh, as I've been asked. I'm going to touch on design, I'm going to talk about small rural projects which is the, the bulk of our own experience. Uh, also on settlements or, or extensions to, to, to places that are existing and also some urban stuff. Malcolm was keen that I touched on that. And then some final thoughts, so I'll keep you in suspense about that. Uh, my own organisation, Macker, Macker is a, a word that's been used in in Scotland for quite a number of hundred years. It's really something to do with creativity, workmanship and, and things that are well made in a sense and um, it seemed an appropriate uh, uh, title for, for what we're about. Our own purpose, we exist really to because we believe that better, better places uh, help people's potential. We, we actually feel very passionate about that. Um, I suppose as an architect one thinks about buildings but I've, I've moved on with my own thinking uh, in over the years to actually understand that place, space, it's not about buildings, it's about, it's about environments, it's about, and from there it blossoms out further but it's all about people at a certain, a certain level. A number of influences, um, when you build an organisation uh, you need to know uh, what it is that you exist to do and I know that most of you represent organisations in here and, and this set of questions from, from Peter Drucker, some of, some of you will know of the, the father of management are, are very simple questions but they're very profound questions and they're things that we should be asking ourselves on a very regular basis as leaders of organisations the idea about service, you know, we all have primary and secondary customers you know, to, to actually understand our customer, our customer's values. In, in many respects, what we've done is, in MACA is we've moved beyond ordinary kind of uh, constrained architectural practice to, to embrace larger things. And most of it's about responding to people, to customers, what customers need. Results, you can, you can, you, you can actually map how you're doing. You, you can have uh, performance related stuff going on. And then the final one is where are you going? What's the plan? Which is the, the central kind of theme here. Ethics and values. Like people, organisations have to have uh, values and ethics at their core. And that's another, another important thing in any organisation. Um, ethics for me, after many, th many, uh, many years thinking about this and various, uh, various uh, books and, and whatever, it comes down to what is good and what is right, in, in, my, in my view. Um, and also, what, what, what you're good at, you, you, need to be able to, you need to be good at something to, to, to actually excel at it. And to be passionate about it is actually quite helpful. And, and finally, what, what is it that you can do to, to make a difference? Now, if, also from Drucker, um, efficiency. Uh, managers have to do things that, uh, the right way, but leaders, uh, in a sense, have to do the right thing. And there's a subtle but important difference there. My own organisation is, is really defined by balancing these kind of things. Ecology, in, in, a, in a deep sense, the, the, the kind of the biosphere, that we've all come to realise is so important in the past few decades. Economy, not just a financial system, but something deeper than, than that, a real kind of economic understanding. Then equity uh, between people uh, within organisations and all the people that we touch. So 
So, in a sense, design or planning is, a, is about intentions. It's about what, what it is, what, what we intend to do. Uh, perhaps the first sig signal of human intention. And it has to lead to, to the next stage. It's a two-stage process, which is about actions. So what is our intention? That's the first thing. What, what is it we're trying to do? That's the most important thing in, in design, getting clear about what, what it is we're trying to do. Um, and, and as I say, it's, it's got to lead to, to real things. And in, in a sense, that delivery side of things, as, as we've just heard from Ruri, is, is actually where most of our focus ends up. So, so just what are better places? What's that all about? Well, what I'm going to suggest here is basically is based on two things that I've come to realize. It's, it's stuff we can, more tangible stuff, stuff we can measure, stuff we can point at and, and, and talk about easily. And this scary image is, is an example of, this is from um, Carbon Images, I think it's called. Um, that's New York City's carbon footprint for one day, expressed as, as actual physical space in terms of carbon. So things you can measure, like energy efficiency or carbon, some of these things. And then less ta tangible things, things that, that are about how we feel in places. And these things are, are just as important as the ones we can measure, particularly in planning and architecture. So how do we feel about that? Most of you know, will know where that is. And how does that make us feel? These things are important. Now can, can we get clear about desirable outcomes? In design, what we tend to do is we tend to reduce what we're trying to do to a, we restrict our, what we're trying to do to some extent. We're not trying to do everything at once. And that's a really, really important key aspect of, of design. But we're also working at different scales. And we need to be aware of that as we're working. So that there's certain uh, immediate impacts, local impacts, regional obviously, right up to, to the macro scale. So again, another reference of mine, the, uh, there's a lot of creativity in, in management, particularly in, in, uh, in, in the United States at the moment. But Jim Collins, and he's got several books, but one of, the, one of his, more, his more recent ones, a great by choice, he talks about this SMAC model, which is getting, for, for organizations, businesses, designers, getting specific, methodical, and consistent with what we're working with. And this idea of actually limiting what we're doing to, to a clear understanding of three or four moves, perhaps. Anyway, I'm gonna move on with these, these three themes now, so small, small scale rural stuff. What that's about for us is, um, as I say, I've been building houses, I've built about 60 or 70 houses around the country, so, so really what that's about is, is three things. And it's actually, the, the trick is not to compromise on these three things. Customer needs, that's all about the focus, what the customer needs and, and wants and desires. Um, site context, that, that site analysis, which is so crucial because every site is different, every site is special. And then the third one, which is very seldom thought about, which is the one that Macker has been focused on, particularly recently, is that whole flexible, customized deli delivery of things, which I'm gonna talk about. Just a few images, I'm gonna shoot through these. This is the past 20 years of my work. Not all of it, <laughs> isn't it to say. Uh, some early stuff there. Uh, there's one, the bottom right there is uh, down in Dumfries and Galloway. Various houses, mainly houses, but there's some offices in here as well. The bottom left there is, is in Angus in Montrose. They're not all expensive houses either. The bottom right, this one here is a, is a small house that was funded under a, a ROG grant. Other, other projects around the country, Murray, um, mainly in Vernesse. Some very recent ones. Uh, the top image is actually a semi-detached um, rural house for under again under a rock scheme, so it's a, a social uh, funded house. And the bottom image is a, is a recent one in Comrie, Perthshire. So what we're trying to do there, our focus as an organisation, is particularly on this idea of an ecological consciousness, I suppose, the, this way of actually expressing ourselves through 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 working with the forces of, of 
of positive force is rather than that industrial idea of using force, as a, again as a subtle difference. Timber has always been a very important focus for us, particularly uh, in the Highlands where we have so much of it, and, and obviously the, the, the closer to source the better. We're interested in, in actually uh, an integrated approach to designing and then manufacturing and, and delivering projects in a seamless manner. Scotland has, is sitting on two-thirds of the UK resource of timber and that would maybe give us an, an, a sort of sign that there's an opportunity there to actually build on. So what's generally called a timber first approach is probably a good idea. Um, in most other countries in Europe, um, for example, not to, to put Ruri on, is Ruri still with us, is he? He's had to leave, oh, that's okay then. Uh, a, a large building like UHI, the large building there, probably might have been a timber building in Europe. And it's kind of frustrating in a sense that, that we end up with steel and concrete, but anyway, I won't go too much on about that. But in some respects, by, by using the materials, we, we actually influence the future of the resource as well. Things have moved on in Europe generally, and our own methods have actually been influenced uh, significantly by what's happening in Europe. Um, I was hearing on the radio the other day that niche engineering companies are doing particularly well. well we actually regard ourselves more as an engineering company than, than a construction company. We're basically an engineer construction company. Uh, we're focused on off-site construction. That's our workshop up at, uh, it's just actually two miles from here, that way. It was uh, it was open just two years ago, and um, just a few images from that. But what we're basically doing in here is we're moving construction from the from the on-site um, context to, to an off-site. It's as simple as that. But the, the actual implications in real terms of quality and lack of, of wastage, uh, safety, uh, skills development, there's so many positives that you can actually bring to this. So. Um, and one of the primary ones is it's really driving up quality and, and reducing cost. Because as soon as in, in manufacture, when you understand how long it takes to make things, and how much, and in, in a very, very detailed, tangible way, how, how, how much materials you, knew, you use, you can actually understand your costs extremely well. So just to, to wrap up that first bit, um, we're on time, not too bad. Uh, the three, three or four moves that were, this, okay it's five moves here, but what we're looking to do really is, is deliver small rural placemaking projects with, with integration. That's the first message I guess. Uh, local resources are important and we could be doing more of it to get more regional identity in buildings. I think we could be doing a lot with innovative services in rural situations. And there's an awful lot of technical innovations in that area that, we, that not everyone actually perceives are possible. We obviously need affordable access to land. And I um, actually bumped into John Watt, who was actually part of the, the, uh, the land reform group actually earlier in here. I asked him if he was coming here. He said, no, he, he doesn't do conferences. But anyway, <laughs> uh, there's some actually interesting stuff in that policy reform uh, agenda in, in the, the um, land reform group, particularly on housing and other things, which are, which are worth taking a note of. This is just to remind me to mention that other countries tend to do integrated rural development a wee bit better than us, in my view. And what you're looking at there is a number of land uses. You're looking at forestry, agriculture. You've got, you've got integration of... of uh, <coughs> Of, of civic things, you've, you've, got, you've got domestic things, you've got industry, you've got all kinds of things happening. And this was a dying part of Switzerland apparently, that's been brought back to life through um, positive policies. Okay, the second one I'm going to mention is some work we've been doing over the years on, on uh, settlement placemaking. That's the term I tend to use for, for small groups of houses or, or larger groups. Over the years I've been very much influenced by McHarg. Hopefully you guys know about Ian McHarg and some of the important work he did after he left Scotland to, to, to reside in. He came back to Scotland as a tourist, as he, as he called it, 
but some of the work he did in the 70s particularly on, the, on regional scale ecological planning is as relevant today than it was then and it's something that we should take more, more notice of. Um, in terms of, of settlement extensions and, and uh, suburban work I guess you, you might call it, what we're particularly keen on ourselves are, are, are mixed use settlements, so, so moving away from single function. Uh, low carbon, this is going to become a bigger and bigger policy issue as we move forward as we know. Again, regional, regional expression, you might say, uh, and design that fosters health and well-being as a fundamental. And then I've, I've mentioned the other one already. We're kind of lucky in some respects in Scotland because we actually already have historical precedent for this type of work in my view. And again, um, some of you have maybe heard of me speaking about this in the past, but if you look at what we're trying to do with settlements, we've got, some, we've got a really good example, which are, in my view, the planned settlements of the late 18th and, and 19th centuries. And they have, they, they have this kind of expression, including those, those terms there. So, so this is from uh, Naismith. And he's talking about maybe 250. Depending on, on your reference, there might be up to 500 of these planned settlements across our country. A lot of them, as you see, kind of uh, centred around Aberdeenshire and uh, the north coast there. And what's interesting about them is, is a lot of them are, are reaching sort of 200 years old now. And that's, that's why the kind of subtext in, in, in the opening you know, wh what are we doing for the next 200 years? What's it all about, you know? And in some respects, these settlements have actually anticipated adaptation and development pretty well. I took this from uh, a report undertaken by uh, Richard Heggie, Urban Animation and others. It was in, in connection with, uh, with some work up in Tom and Towel area. But it's, it's actually, you know, I find this fascinating, this particular diagram of taking, you know, the, 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 the kind of borough idea, um, the medieval idea, and how it's kind of morphed, in a sense, into the next phase, which is the kind of, the, the much more rigid kind of uh, uh, planned town kind of layout. What I need to do, actually, is draw the version now, today, which I'll actually show you a diagram in a minute. So what we're talking about, there's just there's an example, Burghead, I could have, I could have picked any of, of hundreds really. And when you go there, I was there the weekend, so I thought I'd just check it out before this, this conference. It's, it's fascinating how, how, how this place as, as a framework, as a structured place, actually, uh, actually has responded to function. So you've got a real mixture of things going on. There's a sense of community in these places that you simply don't get if you move out to the edge of, of, of Burkhead, for example, or other places with, with areas that are, are, are not so well connected and not so well defined. There you go. That's what I mean there. I'm not here to talk, talk about negative things, really. Uh, Lossy Mouth, just along the coast from Burkhead. The, the, again, a very good example. I don't know Lossy Mouth very well, but I couldn't help but put this in. Again, all kinds of things happening, very adaptable, very, very responsive. Uh, look at the generosity of the streets, you know. Uh, it can actually soak up a lot of cars, you know. Um, unlike the, the sort of developments we're... I've also done some work in, in uh, Beaumore on Isla. Again, a fascinating place to work, always wet. The, uh, <laughs> um, the one that we've been working on, which Malcolm and others know about, which um, staying power, what was it, stickability. Um, we've been on this for at least seven or eight years, this particular project, and the news is that we've finally got some agreement on, on taking it forward, which is really good news. This is a, a Everton's a small village in Easter Ross. Uh, it was a planned village of uh, the, the, um, the early 19th century, and it's got this kind of Christmas tree kind of form to it. And our own site is within a kind of uh, 10 minute walk of, of that planned village. It's between two rivers as you see. Um, we undertook a master plan for the owner uh, fully five years ago actually and we, we, it's quite a lengthy document. 
again, so I'll stick in, I mentioned Geddes in a minute actually, but this survey analysis plan kind of uh, uh, process was, was very much in evidence in this one. And obviously you've got a lot of things to actually mesh together. A lot of interest in, in these type of projects. But in many respects what we did is we looked at the planned villages of Easter Ross, particularly Cromarty, Alness, various other ones in the area. This is Eventon itself, this is just a figure round of, of it. And it just shows this is 200 years of, of evolution. You can actually read that. That's 1807 and that's uh, 2007 I think. Anyway, um, 200 years of development and in actual fact in many respects that the structure has actually anticipated change. We've, we did a lot of this type of work looking at um, again that intangible thing about how, how we feel about it. You know, what's, what's working well, what's working less well. And a lot about uh, focusing on how, how we get the roads to work <laughs> in, in our future projects. And then diagrams like this that lead to kind of more concrete things. So a structured, um, this, is, this is very old now, I'm desperate to, to move on with this, but what it's showing is uh, uh, some real sort of community amenity. So things like allotments and opportunities for tennis courts or bowling greens and that kind of thing that could be taken forward by local groups. We're looking at a very, quite a dense part with a focus uh, to it. Um, we're looking at less dense stuff around the edges. Uh, it's, it's well connected uh, with uh, walking and, and cycling um, and it's the mixed use so, so um, there's just an image of it and we like this term the good ordinary because it's not about the buildings it's about the, the spaces it's about the place a few references we've uh, we've been doing we've been doing our own tours about so um, you know some some obvious ones really you know expressing uh, infrastructure in this way you know in a joyful kind of way and then what we've, we've also realized is that it's down to the last planning the last square meter of, of a development so uh, you know the kind of little touches this little uh, 600 mil space here that allows this this greenery just makes all the difference in some of these schemes so the, the three or four moves in this particular case in the last 10 minutes now mixed use connected so it's relevant to the existing village and it's actually going to enhance the place and actually add something very structured layout it faces the sun for example uh, it deals with vehicles in a, in a sensible manner and it's again sustainably constructed it says something about where it is so the final one is uh, something on, on urban work we've been doing we, we undertook a study for the Inverness City Heritage Trust um, the focus was Academy Street and I thought these particular terms were relevant uh, the final one's a kind of almost old-fashioned idea but it's one I think that's maybe coming back into currency this idea of some kind of civic pride of where we live and if we could get there that would be a great thing Academy Street I'm not sure whether the rain is stopping so you might actually get there but um, it's a, quite a, an important street in Inverness it's, a, it's, it's it makes an important traffic connection and at the moment it's basically overrun with cars it's, it's, it's not a very pleasant place to be it's, it's pretty down at heel and again this was the result this particular piece of work is the result of quite a lot of, of um, a large report that took a, a lengthy period of time we looked at the, the origin of the street the streets at least 500 years old like most infrastructure of its type it's the enduring thing that goes on and on forever um, it was the old, the edge of the, the, the city of Inverness at one point and it's only in the past 100 years, 150 years I should say, it's been called Academy Street. We looked at, this is all the, the survey stuff, so we looked at all the functions, it's quite a wide range, very interesting range of functions. Uh, buildings at risk, we all, we all have them, um, some more at risk than others. We actually undertook a, a survey of every single building, there's 65 buildings in the street and we, we, we assessed every single one of them. We've actually gone on to be uh, hired by the, the new owners of this particular building who are the Cairngorm Brewery 
and we've got an exciting project moving forward with the refurbishment of this one now. We also surveyed things like this, all the clutter in the street, the kind of you know, things that are affecting place and, and that experience. Uh, some of the analysis from that, I'm just shooting through this very quickly, but there was a problem really with the entry to the north side of the, the street. Spaces outside station, station square full of taxis and clutter. Uh, very difficult to get across the street from the river. Um, you actually take your life into your hands <laughs> moving around the area. So down to proposals, just very briefly. So this is the way the street is at the moment. And really what we're proposing here is, is just ways for, for getting shared surfaces, actually re-inhabiting some of the spaces. More joyfully, getting some greening of the street, widening pavements, just changing the, the relationship, particularly with cars and people. There's just an image to wind up the taxi drivers of Inverness. And <laughs> there's another image of, the, of a reorganised north gateway to the, to the town where we've got we've actually got a venue here which has got a little pavement. We thought it might be quite a good idea to move the road a wee bit where it used to be and actually get a space working there. So if it was me and if I had three or four things that I would do in Academy Street to change its dynamic, I'd start thinking about the street as a place, as a, as a quality in itself. I would change this people-car relationship by physical things and just changing it. Improve key buildings, that's, that's a really important thing. We have some lovely historic buildings there that are, are not well looked after. And you remove the clutter, get rid of all the traffic lights, we don't need them. Get rid of them, there's more traffic lights in Academy Street than Bath Street apparently. Anyway, if you do those simple things you would change that place and other things would take, take over. I'm coming to an end of this now, you'll be glad to hear. Um, most of you will know this guy and I won't read it out, but I think that what the last bit there is, is really where, where I, my starting point particularly. And his latest book on, on uh, the work that he's done in, in Europe is worth looking at. So really a few questions and I'm going to show you a very final project w which we're just completing. Um, how can each of us Help, it, help to create better places, really more successful places. And, this, and who's going to do it, you know? It's, it's going to be us. It's got to be us. We've got to take that responsibility on. And what can we do cooperatively? Because I think in the future we've got to use the energies that we have to work together. And part of it is to get clear outcomes, establish those outcomes and work together. There's far too much of, of, in Scotland of people actually pulling each other apart and, turn, and the energy dissipates. So we could do more together, those of us that care about these things. Finally, I'm just going to show you a wee project which is very successful in terms of um, it's a wee social housing project, a place called Fority, that we're just handing over to, to the residents. There's, it's a small, it's a four unit project. Uh, we took possession of the site uh, nine months ago or so and we're, we're just completing it now. This project for four units, two semi-detached uh, blocks, um, would not have been possible to deliver for the £425,000 all-in design build contract if it wasn't for the methods we use, our off-site methods. I'm absolutely convinced about that. It's got a, a private wastewater treatment system. Um, two of the units are part of the, the Scottish Government's Greener Homes Initiative. So they are Section 7 Silver Active, which is equivalent to Passive House Standard. Uh, the other two units are not far behind it. So in other words, they're going to take almost no energy inputs for comfort. Just a few images, I'll just run through these. This is the, the, um, the second units going up here. The site was owned by Highland Council. It's an old school uh, playground. And uh, that's day two on that particular project, so it gives you some idea how fast these things go up. This was taken yesterday, it does, the sun does come out in the Highlands. And one of the things we've tried to do here is really, the final kind of message really is, is that, that kind of, what Richard Heggy calls the fine grain, uh, getting that, that kind of landscape potential in. In this case you can see a hedge 
one of the more wonderful things we've done the last few months is empty my office of overqualified architects, perhaps young, young architects, and have them plant trees and hedges and things. They've never done any of those things before. They've actually enjoyed it. Um, there's, there's another image. They're not great images because we're, we're still trying to finish this project. But fruit trees, there's, a, there's some uh, raised beds, there's actually a common area with a barbecue in it. It's just simple things that are actually going to make a hell of a difference. When you look at the, the actual allocation of funds for that element, for those things that make all the difference, 1.5% of the budget we spent on some of these things that give a joy to the buildings. You'll see just on here we've actually put um, some, some trellises here and some, we've planted up climbers there. So the, 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 the place will become, it will have a character, it will have a, an identity. And at the end of the day, the places that endure are ones that are valued. And the best way to value them are the people that live there. That's it. Thanks very much.